In this lesson, we are going to expand upon what we learned in the previous lesson dealing with polarity and electronegativity. Now we need to look at predicting the polarity of a molecule. So we looked at bonds previously, now we need to look at the entire molecule. And to do this, we have to think about the geometry of the molecule, as well as the presence and location of any lone pairs of electrons on the central atom. The first thing we want to look at is the polarity of the bonds in the molecule to determine the overall polarity. For example, molecules that only have nonpolar bonds will always be nonpolar. For molecules with polar bonds, we have to look further to determine whether the molecule overall is polar or nonpolar. And what we look at is how the polarity of those bonds cancel or don't to determine the net polarity. So in the previous lesson, we talked about the tug-of-war game between the two teams, the soldiers and the kids, and how it was an uneven matchup, that one way was pulling harder than the other. And we weren't really concerned about who actually won in the end. What we were really saying is that there was a difference in strengths of those two teams. We're going to do the same thing when we look at our molecules. Only now we can't just think of two teams, sometimes we have to think of two, three, or even four teams, and so we kind of have to think about being in three-dimensional space with our tug-of-war game. So our first example is CO2. We've got two bonds to worry about. We have two double bonds, and we have a carbon here in the middle, and we have an oxygen on the ends. So we're going to worry about this bond and this bond. And what I look at is first I'm going to look at just at the carbon-oxygen bond. And what I know is that there's a difference in electronegativity between these two values. So I know that this is a polar covalent bond. Now I also have another carbon and oxygen on the other side and that is also a polar covalent bond. And what I see is that I have two bonds, both polar. But what I have to worry about now is whether or not things are going to cancel out. Because I know, based on my periodic trends, that oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. So I label the oxygen with a partial negative, my carbon with a partial positive, and my oxygen with a partial negative. And what that tells me is the electrons are spending more time around the oxygen atoms than they are around the carbon atom. But what I see is that the amount, okay, so if I draw the arrow representation, so, there, so if I draw that for this direction, okay, it looks something like that, where there's a magnitude and a direction, and I notice if I look in the other direction, I see it's equal, should be equal in size, it may not look that way, but it's going in the opposite direction. So if I was imagining the T, the oxygen atoms being two tug-of-war teams and the carbon atom being the kind of rope or tie in the middle, what I would see is that no one wins this game. The oxygen atoms are pulling equally and opposite on that central carbon atom. And so while we have two polar bonds, overall our molecule is nonpolar. Now we have HCN, so we have our hydrogen, our carbon, and our nitrogen. And again, I'm going to look at the bonds, and I see that this is a polar bond, that this is a polar bond. But now, but now what I want to look at is to compare the polarities of these two bonds. And what I see is that the polarity of the bond here has a different polarity than the bond here. I'm not worried about how they're different or which one is stronger or weaker or what, it doesn't matter. All we're worried about is that they are different. So now we have two unevenly matched teams. And so what I see now is that now if I were doing tug of war and I have a team here on the white end and the purple end between the hydrogen and nitrogen, again the carbon atom is the tie in the middle, that somebody's going to win this game and somebody's going to lose. And ultimately that's the only question I'm worried about. Is somebody win or lose, then I can say this is a polar molecule.
Now we're going to go beyond our two directions or our two groups around the central atom to go to three. So now we need to again think about that this is a three-way tug-of-war match. And again, we're going to look at our bonds. And when I look at boron and chlorine, I know that there's a difference in electronegativity. So here I have a polar bond. Here I have a polar bond. And here I have a polar bond. But what I see is that if I had three teams evenly pulling on this central boron atom, okay, that tie in the middle of my tug of war game, they're all pulling the exact same amount because the polarity of this bond is exactly the same as the polarity of this bond, which is exactly the same as the polarity of this last bond. So since the polarity of the bonds are all exactly the same and they're all pulling evenly on that central atom, overall this will be a nonpolar molecule. This one's a little bit trickier because now we're no longer in a plane, but we're in three-dimensional space. We have a molecule here that's tetrahedral. We have four hydrogen atoms, and we have a carbon atom in the middle. Remember that in a tetrahedral geometry, all of the bonds are evenly distributed, that 109.5 degree angle, around that central carbon atom. So do you think this molecule is going to be polar or nonpolar? So the molecule will be nonpolar because what we see is that each of these bonds is exactly the same. Any difference in polarity from the carbon and hydrogen will be the same for all four and they're all pulling evenly and in very symmetrical directions and as a result this will be a game of tug of war. We have to go into three dimensional into space and worry about the 3D tug of war game. But what we see is that they all pull evenly on that central atom. Therefore, nobody would win this tug of war game. And overall, what we see is we have a nonpolar molecule. Now here we have another tetrahedral molecule. We still have four groups around our central atom. We have three hydrogens and one chlorine. So think back to the example with the HCN. Do you think this molecule is going to be polar or nonpolar? So when we look at the bonds, what we see is that we have three bonds whose polarity is going to be the same because the difference in electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen will always be the same. And we see another bond, the fourth bond here, that's going to be different because the electronegativity difference between carbon and chlorine is different than that of the carbon and hydrogen. And as a result, we have one bond that's different. So these are still all 109.5 degrees from one another. And as a result, we're not going to see the canceling out like we did with the CH4. So if we imagine this as our tug of war game, we can imagine that one team, the green team here, is of different strength than the white teams, which are representing the hydrogens. And so because we have one team that's different, what we see is that overall this will be a polar molecule. Now let's look at an example where we have a lone pair of electrons on our central atom. So NH3 has a lone pair of electrons on nitrogen and it still has a tetrahedral geometry. So when we talked about geometry, we talked about how this lone pair still affects the behavior and the positions of these atoms, that we still describe the overall geometry or the electron group geometry as tetrahedral. So what I see is that the bond angles are still approximately 109.5 and that we can imagine we have our lone pair of electrons up here where our fourth bond would have been. But the key thing to remember is that these bond angles are still 109.5 from one another. Okay. They're approximately that. They are not going to trigonal planar because those lone pairs still affect the position. So what we have here is it's we have our three uh, bonds that all have the identical polarity and we have an empty spot. The empty spot doesn't affect the overall polarity of the molecule, but the empty spot affects the position of these atoms. And because they're no longer symmetrical and canceling each other out, we are still left with a polar molecule. 
In thinking about this with our tug of war game, what we can do is say, well, what happens if we're playing tug of war with our four teams and one team walks away? The other teams are in their same position, but clearly they will be able to pull this central atom downwards okay, and away from where that team was that left. Okay? So imagine again, this team leaves and what we're left with is an uneven matchup now between the other three teams. And so what this leaves us with is a polar molecule. Now in general, not always, but most of the time, what we see is that if we have a lone pair of electrons on a molecule that has linear, trigonal planar, or tetrahedral geometry, we are always going to see that it is a polar molecule. Is water polar or nonpolar? I've shown you two drawings here. One, a more three-dimensional drawing, and the other one is the Lewis structure. So hopefully you recognize that this is a polar molecule. So much like our example with NH3, we have two lone pairs, and we know that this angle is approximately 109.5. It'll actually be a little bit less, but these are clearly not linear. So even though the Lewis structure shows this as a linear orientation, that does not mean that's what's present in the 3D molecule. So we can show them across from one another, the bonds across from one another, but in the molecule they're not. And so because we still have that tetrahedral electron group geometry and we have our lone pair, so now we have two teams that walked away from our tug-of-war game, this will be a polar molecule.